Hello and welcome to the seventh season of Bad Movie Down. After a bit of a quiet period, I'm back in the saddle, and it's time to get round to some movies that I've been promising for a very long time, but just haven't got round to. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a good day to die hard. As you may know, Die Hard is easily one of my favourite action movies. In fact, it may well be the quintessential example of the genre. Originally adapted from a Roderick Thorpe novel called Nothing Lasts Forever, the film was a massive hit back in 1988 and shot Bruce Willis into superstardom. Die Hard is basically like striking lightning as everything from the script to the direction to the casting is nothing short of excellent, but its real trick was its premise. Detective John McClane was an ordinary man in the wrong place at the wrong time, and in an era dominated by the rippling muscles of Arnold and Stallone, his vulnerability gave the film some humanity. He's outnumbered, barefooted, and doesn't know if he'll make it through the night with only his wits to help him survive. Its impact on the genre cannot be understated. For many years, filmmakers copied its template, sometimes quite successfully, and it spawned two solid sequels. Over a decade later, the series was revived in 2007 with Len Wiseman's Die Hard 4.0, or Live Free or Die Hard in the US, which saw McLean return as a throwback hero, and while it may not be the best Die Hard movie, it is an enjoyable action flick in its own right, despite being hampered by a studio mandated PG-13 rating that meant that McLean couldn't even deliver his signature catchphrase, yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. Despite 4.0 dividing the fan base, the fact they managed to get four films out of some poor bastard stumbling into terrorist plots and still keep up a high standard is quite impressive but then they had a bad day. A Good Day to Die Hard had two things hanging against it from the start. Writer Skip Woods, whose credits include Hitman and X-Men Origins Wolverine, and Irish director John Moore, a 20th century fox hack who helmed Max Payne as well as unnecessary remakes of Flight of the Phoenix and The Omen. Those aren't CVs, those are bad movie graveyards. Woods was asked by Willis to develop a story about McLean going to Russia after his long lost son, who had been very briefly seen in the first movie and was an idea previously considered for the the fourth film in the role that ultimately became Justin Long's hacker. This of course being part of the brief period where we became fascinated by Russia before we decided it wasn't so cool after all. However, even into production the film's script was still not locked, with the major twist and main villain being undecided at least two weeks into filming, and the notoriously difficult Willis assigning himself the task of protecting the series' integrity by refusing any cute callbacks to earlier films. I highly recommend watching the hour-long Blu-ray documentary entry Making It Hard to Die, which covers virtually every aspect of the film's production, and you can see how much effort goes into making a film like this and the terrible choices being made at every turn, including interviews with crew that look more exhausted than enthusiastic, Die Hard 5 means no script, no schedule, and John Wall being the height of professionalism. Oh, we got the Die Hard! Oh, shit! Yes! Oh, yes! In the US, the film was released with an R rating to lure back fans turned away by its team of predecessor. In the UK, it was released in a heavily censored version so that 12 year olds could see it as it came out during the school holidays, a tactic that proved highly successful for Taken 2 and was the version I saw in cinemas. Worse, the UK had to endure a notorious interview of Willis on BBC's The One Show, where he appeared to have a sudden realization of just how terrible his film was, which he later claimed was jet lag. And uh, that has that, that die hard off to it, so. Critics absolutely savaged the newest entry with a mere 14% Rotten tomato score and a 28 on Metacritic, and audiences seemed to agree. Although it opened in first over President's Day weekend, it quickly dropped off and is by far the lowest grossing in the series in the US. Like many action films these days, however, it made three times as much internationally, and Willis has been considering the idea of a sixth film to bring the series back to its roots. Because why bother quitting when you're ahead, right? On Blu-ray, a Good Day to Die Hard was released in an extended cut, which is John Moore's director's cut. So I'll be looking at both that and the theatrical version. <sighs> Welcome to the party, pals! The film begins with Russian Defense Minister candidate Chigarin, played by Sergei Kolznikov, visiting Yuri Komarov, played by Sebastian Koch, who is housed in a secure cell awaiting his trial against his former friend. Because that's a great way to start an action film, two old men delivering constant exposition to each other about a supposedly damning file. 
Давай поговорим, как нормальные, интеллигентные люди. Мы же когда-то были друзьями. Можем снова ими стать. Отдай мне папку. И я сделаю так, что ты будешь жить так же, как и прежде. Я больше так жить не хочу. Ah, yes, the mysterious file, which might as well have been called the generic MacGuffin that we just left in the script because we couldn't be bothered to think of anything better. You may also spot that Komarov is playing chess against himself, at one point turning the pieces around so he can play both sides. Symbolism! One of the first things you'll notice is how much this doesn't look or feel like a Die Hard movie in any way, shape or form, even down to the framing. You couldn't even make this in 235 like every other film in the series. And I know modern filmmakers love to teal up their films, but why the hell is everything in this movie so bloody blue? Has Moscow moved underwater? Is this some sort of radiation side effect that I'm previously unaware of? Even the freaking Smurfs was less blue in this film. The CIA believe Jagaran is going to try and take out Komarov, so they activate their local agent, Jack McClane, played by Jai Courtney, who wanders into a nightclub and pretending he's under Komarov's orders, shoots this random bloke in the head if you're watching the extended cut. They couldn't just place him in prison, no, he had to outright murder some guy. Great introduction to one of our main heroes. Speaking of introductions, we first meet John McClane, once again played by Bruce Willis, in this totally convincing NYPD firing range. Look, there's a picture of Obama. Clearly this is America. One of John's cop friends, played by Amore in Alaska, tells him about Jack's rap sheet. What's he charged with? It's a nasty sheet. He's lucky to get life. He can never get out of his own way. Had a lot of problems. He's still my kid. Vaguely defined issues that we're never going to elaborate on. For that matter, why the hell is he operating under his own name? Even if he was using his mother's main name, Gennaro, they'd still be able to trace him to a guy that has thwarted terrorist plots on four separate occasions. possible to be screaming while firing off his gun and still appear to be underacting. John is driven to JFK Airport, which looks much more Eastern European these days, by his daughter Lucy, who is briefly reprised by Mary Elizabeth Winstead from the fourth film. Dad, just try, try not to make an even bigger mess of things. Good luck. How exactly is he going to do that? Your brother is on trial for murder in Russia! Which he seems to be treating rather lightly, all things considered. However, in one of the most bizarre decisions, the extended cut actually removes footage. Namely, it cuts any trace of Mary Elizabeth Winstead from the film, possibly because her appearance was a studio mandate. Although they couldn't be bothered to remove her from the credits, so they slapped on a disclaimer. To do this, they reuse audio of the cop from the previous scene to make it appear that he drove John to the airport, while adding a lens flare onto the windshield to block out Lucy in the establishing shot. Thanks, kid. Clay, good luck. See you soon. Clearly, Mary Elizabeth Winstead was the biggest problem with this movie. That shitty cut and paste dog is such an improvement. So John flies over to Moscow, where he soon encounters the only Russian character who's not trying to kill him, but does attempt to pierce his eardrums. Traffic sucks here, too. Garden ring. It's bad. Always traffic. Always traffic. You American? Yeah. American. New York. I want to wake up in a city that never sleeps. Yeah, that's it. Never sleeps. Frank Sinatra, chairman of the board. That's right. Top of the world. Huh? No, 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 stop singing. Shit, it's enough to make time for Argyle and some classic run DMC. Jack agrees to testify against Komarov so he can be in the same courthouse at the trial, which is surrounded by protesters and security. It's here that John first sees his son as he's being carried out, which might have had more emotional impact had Bruce Willis's material clearly wasn't filmed separately. But also arriving is some men working for Jagarin, led by Rasha Bookfix Alec, who is barely introduced, but we know it's evil because he doesn't care about the people driving the car bombs they've somehow smuggled through, even though they appear to make no attempt to leave before they blow up, apparently taking half the court with it, and evaporating any security, evidently. 
Luckily, Jack and Comoros holding cells protected them from the blast and allows them to just stroll right out. So Jack, who was assigned to protect Comoros, was just figuring on the fact that armed forces would blow up the building and severely kill and injure many civilians in the process, or that the defense minister candidate would plan an attack that he himself would be responsible for. Good plans, guys! Jack retrieves his van and tries to get Comrov out, but he didn't count on the sudden appearance of his dad or his charge walking out into the street like a moron to get spoiled by Alec. Jack! What are you doing? You're gonna shoot your own father? Shouldn't be here, John. You know, Jack is really kind of an asshole. I know he hasn't got time to spare, but he just pulled a gun on a guy who is a national hero by this point. Not to mention that John doesn't seem particularly bothered about the fact that his son is staging a jailbreak, or the fact that someone just fired a machine gun in their general direction. Jack and Comrov speed away from John in the van, soon followed by Alec in an armoured car. Not to feel left out, John decides to steal a van and joins the chase as the proverbial third wheel. It appears the filmmakers are not so much copying Die Hard as the Bourne films as Jack is behind schedule on his mission. This guy's late. His rate of progress is way off. MET now plus six minutes. 6-1, the advised your window is closed. Time on target is no go. Reaper, this is real world, not exercise. Do you copy? No, sir, Moscow. Police will shut down the garden wing. Tell them it's Plan B safe house. Go now! Yes, sir. That's Plan B, no choice. Shit. They shut the garden ring. Damn you, McClay! Why the hell are you so pissed off at him? Yeah, he held you up for a minute, but he wasn't the one who closed off a main road that was already jammed before this whole thing started. So great strategy, guys. And so begins the punishingly long car chase that takes up well over 10 minutes of the movie's relatively short 97 minute running time. And if you watch the extended cut, it's longer still, so you can see Jack out with Alec and his driver like a pair of Home Alone villains. The filmmakers seem to be under the impression that the lengthier and more prolonged an action set piece is, the better, instead of becoming numbing and repetitive. This is a subpar Michael Bay impersonation, and part of this is the horrendous cinematography and editing that makes it hard to even look at. The original Die Hard is a masterclass in photography, especially on the big screen. Director John McTiernan and DOP Jan de Bond, who later became a director in his own right, film the movie in long and expansive camera movements that allow you to absorb the space with memorable landmarks so you can recognise areas when McLean goes back through them again that itself adds the enclosed feel as part of the plot. Even in the car based with a vengeance you still got a sense of geography as they tore through New York. In a good day it's a dizzying Mercedes Benz ad made up of close ups, crash zooms and wide angles that move and cut so fast it never allows you any balance or even work out the logic of the editing unless you want a huge migraine. Yeah sure the action is huge, but why should I care about any of it? I can't see past of it. I have no idea who half the people involved are or where they are in relation to each other. It's just an impenetrable war of noise and fury, and it's not like it has much point anyway. Even John has no idea what's going on. Jack, I'm not done talking to you. <laughs> who is this? You're a cop who is chasing your criminal son in a stolen car in a highly destructive rampage across the city, ramming people you don't even know! Yes, yeah, sure, McLean's an accidental hero, but here he's just throwing himself into the action, which is just plain stupid. I can't even give credit to the stunt work, because despite a lot of it being done practically, there are numerous times where cars move before they even hit. And if you're watching the extended cut, look out for the same yellow and grey van smashed up three times without fixing the earlier damage. At the back of the pack, Willis really gets the short shrift, having virtually nothing to do much of the time other than shout JESUS! And it doesn't help they don't appear to have filmed anywhere near enough close-ups of him driving. There are moments where they recycle footage, like him clearly spinning as he swerves to avoid a van, which is taken from the later RPG gag. Man. How on earth do 
you managed to miss with an RPG at point blank range. Not to mention being flipped like that would have turned John's spine into jelly. And where the hell are the police in all this? The car's getting crushed and exploded in the aftermath of a political bombing. But nope, John just shakes off the whiplash so he can run into traffic to get a new car and predictably ends up getting hit by one. <laughs> Do you think I understand a word you're saying? Jesus Christ. I'm fine, thanks. How dare he speak Russian in the middle of Russia? Good thing the left hand of Patriot John McClain was there to teach him the proper American language. I'm out here driving like my grandma. When I say drive, I mean fly. <laughs> Yeah, that was an obvious conclusion to make, especially since you somehow end up on a ramp when you were behind Jack's van on a straight road 10 seconds ago. Clearly John has the same idea, apparently now playing Grand Theft Auto, as to rejoin the chase, he smashes through a bridge using a car carrier trailer as a ramp down before driving over the oncoming traffic. with innocent civilians inside in the middle of gridlock traffic. It's not a question of whether he killed people doing that, it's a question of how many. Also, this is another spot where Lucy is removed in the extended cut, as in the theatrical version, she hilariously calls her dad in the middle of all this. Oh, for the love of Hi, honey. Dad, can you hear me? I'm on the right back. Wait, no, don't, don't. Yeah, honey, if you turn on to CNN, you can see exactly what I'm doing right now. At least that does provide Willis with some business, no matter how corny. When Alec manages to pin Jack's van to the front of his armoured car, John manages to catch up and ram Alec to free his son. In the theatrical cut, there's a joke as he speaks with Lucy as they catch sight of each other, while in the extended cut, they just glower silently, riveting. John finally goes head to head with Alec. Oh man, hey! Hmm, that sounds awfully familiar. That is! That's your best shot! That's right, apparently you can't even get Bruce Willis in an ADR booth, so he's just taking a line from the previous movie and inserted it in to give John more dialogue, even though it doesn't make any sense. This is some Steven Seagal level editing right here. Not to mention they use the exact same shot of him putting away his phone twice, or the fact they use this exact same bit of dialogue twice. Get out of the way! Get out of the way! Evidently an armoured car is no match for a Mercedes 4x4 as John manages to flip it over, sending it hurtling off another bridge straight through a truck carrying a concrete column into a wall. Despite this, Alec manages to walk out of the devastating collision that would have certainly killed him intact and even his henchmen in the back limp out. What bullshit! Oh, and now the police have turned up as Alec opens fire on them. Jack swings back around to pick up his dad, finally bringing this absolute clusterfuck to a merciful end. So John McClane's been off the plane maybe about an hour or so, and so far he's managed to get caught in an explosion, hit by a car, and been involved in not one, but two significant car wrecks, all of which left him completely unharmed. So much for the laceable everyman, huh? They've reached the CIA safe house where Jack regroups with his partner Collins, played by Cole Hauser, where John discovers his son's true occupation. Take this. Oh my Jesus. You're a spy. Oh my God. Double O seven of Plainfield, New Jersey. The fact that his son is some beefed up secret agent goes completely against the spirit of the series, which is an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances, not a traditional action hero. The spawn of John McClane shouldn't be a cross between Arnie and James Bond. Collins asks Komarov to tell him where the file is in exchange for his freedom, but Komarov wants his daughter's safety instead, and says the file is in a vault in Prepyat. <sighs> we'll get to that. He makes the call to meet his daughter in a nearby hotel while glancing meaningfully into a mirror. SIMULATOR! In case you still don't bloody get it. Let's go. Where the 
hell did that sniper come from? There is no way someone could have shot them from that direction. And why would they give away their position by shooting Komarov in the arm for no reason? Yep, the bad guys have shown up at the safe house, and as Jack protects Komarov, John mows down the oncoming horde. Jack off! No, you aren't! You came to Russia to see your long lost son go on trial for murder! Hardly exactly kicking up your feet! Jack blows a hole through a wall because everything is solved with explosions in this film, allowing the three to escape, and they soon take refuge in an abandoned market to figure out their next move. I'm so fucking burned, I got no friends in this town anymore. What about your people at Langley? Just give them a call. Give your phone. To your contract on that phone. John's annoyed about his phone being destroyed. That's funny, that didn't seem to be much of a problem in the last movie. Wait, no, 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 don't, what? don't, don't call. What? They probably cracked that hours ago. If you use it, they might be able to trace us here. Just put it in your pocket. Sure? Yes. Or smash it. You meant to smash it. But hey, this sequel already has virtually no continuity with any of the preceding films, so why would I expect them to remember that? Jack decides to continue the mission, and an attack on scene no doubt added to say why they don't just go to the embassy explains that since he's caused a massive diplomatic incident, he needs to retrieve Komarov's file, otherwise he'll end up taking the fall. It turns out the hotel is full of security at the front, but luckily there's none at the back, which just so happens to be under construction. You should hang here a second. Keep an eye on him, John. Hey, what is with all this John shit? What happened to Dad? Good question. Are we seriously doing the whole, I hate my dad, so I'm calling him by his first name crap? That's the sort of annoying behaviour you see out of whiny teenage characters, not 20-something covert agents. In fact, much of the dialogue that the two McLean share together is incredibly one note and cliche, sounding like placeholder lines devoid of any kind of wit as they keep saying the same things over and over again. Here's the gist of their conversations. Jack! Shut up. Jack! What was that, John? Five minutes? I'm still your father. Yeah, nothing I can do about that. Jack! Damn you, John. Do that Emily Cummins. Shut up! Shut up! Jack! Jack! Carol Ann! Seriously, half of Bruce Willis' lines end with him saying his son's name like if he stopped saying it, he might forget what he's called. Although, given how bland he is, he's probably right. Is he your only child? I got a daughter, too. I have only my son, Mishka. When she was little, I was working all the time. I believed work was all that mattered. I screwed my kid's life up, too. Work all the time, round the clock, most of the time, and you're cut. I just thought that... Working all the time was a, a good thing, you know? Didn't help him at all. What is this? A cloying family comedy? Are we seriously doing the workaholic dad routine in an action movie? Oh, boo-hoo, my father was away from home all the time. He was fighting terrorists. I think that gets him a pass. And it's not like that's something that couldn't have been easily fixed. Like, oh, I fought alcoholism and left my wife and kids to go back to New York. You know, like in Die Hard with a Vengeance. It's like the people who made this movie haven't even seen the other films. They can't even keep the characterization consistent. And if you don't have that, he's not John McClane. It's just another Bruce Willis action movie. And trust me, I'm not exactly lying up to watch Striking Distance 2. Despite not speaking a word of Russian, John manages to bribe a hotel staff member to give their key card to use the lift and grant them access to the ballroom, thereby making sure that we have a token scene set in a lift. See? Totally die hard. Arming themselves with shotguns, they meet up with Komarov's daughter, Irena, played by Yulia Snigia. Need a hug? Yeah, we're men! We only bond over guns and violence! Because that's totally how John McClane behaves. Irena may be playing the innocent, but we know she's not, given that we've previously seen her seducing Jagarin and storming the courthouse alongside Alec, and John senses something is up. How'd you get over here so quick? I took garden ring. Oh, the garden ring. It's supposed to always be bad, right? You stuck in traffic? Good thing that cabbie just happened to bring out the garden ring, so that John can apparently know Moscow better than people that actually live there. Although frankly, I'd be more suspicious about the fact that she arrived so quickly, considering you destroyed half the damn city an hour ago. 
Just as Komarov manages to find the key to the vault they hid away in a radiator, Alec and his men surround and quickly tie up the two McLeans. Because this is a nice spot for an ambush, and Arena takes her father hostage. Do you know what I hate about the Americans? Everything, especially cowboys. Could have been a dancer. I swear to God. Wee! Look at me! I'm tap dancing and chewing on carrots. I've totally got a personality. Say it for Moscow's Got Talent when you have to go up against a cabbie that's mangling Frank Sinatra show tunes. As you can tell, Alec is struck with a fatal case of talking villain syndrome, monologuing instead of killing the pair like he should, giving Jack ample time to grab a hidden knife. You guys, so arrogant. It's not 1986, you know. Reagan is dead. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny there? <laughs> Can't tell. That joke might have made slightly more sense if he said 1988. You know, the year that Die Hard came out? Maybe that's why they've dubbed in someone else's laughing for Bruce Willis. Let's dance. Jack cut through his restraints, but how the hell did John manage to free himself? They just straight up disappeared from his race in an instant. During another mess of an action scene, the McLeans dive behind the bar for cover. Do you remember the last time we talked this before you went away? No, 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 you're not gonna open up to me right before we die. So that's not your thing, John. What's my thing? I can kill a bad guy, that's your thing. No, it's not. He's John McClane, not John freaking Rambo. Annihilating bad guys with a big ass machine gun is not his style. Except in this movie, where he's turned into some sort of senile murder machine. Incidentally, one of the most merrill moments in Die Hard is the bad guys intentionally shattering the glass surrounding John, knowing they'll have to run across it in his bare feet. Originally, this scene was meant to reference this by having John say, shoot the glass, when he notices the stained glass panels above the baddies, but Willis objected, so now the scene plays like this. You're not gonna die today! See? Much better! Now they telepathically knew to shoot the glass, which is so much less distracting than an obvious reference. They kill the goons, but Alec manages to escape with Arena and Komarov in their helicopter on an adjacent rooftop. Not content with the obvious victory, the helicopter swings back around as our heroes gawp like idiots to open fire on them. Spotting the scaffolding, the McLeans run through the line of fire and suicidally dive straight out the window, smashing down onto it several floors below. Okay, in the original Die Hard, when he played Tarzan with a fire hose, it was a last resort. He was cornered by the FBI on a rooftop he knew was wired to explode and he would likely die, but it was his only chance and he was scared shitless. That's a big difference to charging out of a window with no hesitation whatsoever. They could have leapt straight to their deaths. In fact, they kind of do that anyway, as they slide down the construction tubes as the helicopter spots them and opens fire once more, managing to shoot holes so it completely falls apart, and they fall at least a third the way to the ground, landing in a skip filled with construction materials. Needless to say, they're completely fine. By any measure, that would have fucking killed them. Even Rasputin would ask to take a breather after that one. However, I have an explanation for why John McClane keeps surviving these movies. When John McClane was a rural farm boy, he found this mysterious glowing green crystal. He didn't think much of it at the time, but later in life it gifted him with superhuman strength and endurance that became quite useful in his numerous encounters with terrorists. And even though it made him lose his hair, those powers only increased with age to the point of near invincibility. That's my personal headcan anyway. Jagaran calls up Alec and tells him to retrieve Komarov's file and then kill the father and daughter. I only mention it because of this shot. What the hell was that all about? Was he leading a charity walk of public defenders or something? With the rational plan of Jack all as for ideas, they share a quiet moment together where they finally decide to bother explaining the plot. What's in the file? Evidence on Jagaran. Evidence about what? Chernobyl. 
Komarov and Shigarin used to have this nasty little side racket going on back in the day. They siphoned weapons grade uranium, got greedy, caused a meltdown. First of all, Chernobyl, not a meltdown. Second, the idea that these two people sabotaged it to steal uranium is absolutely absurd. And three, if Jagarin had Komarov arrested to keep him silent, then he's done a pretty shitty job about it, considering Komarov has only been in prison for five years. And despite the fact that his son is in obvious pain, even though they're lucky not to have a limb out of place, John spends this conversation mocking and bullying his son for it like a total dick. You're not gonna cry, are you? Everybody needs a good cry once in a while, Jack. Don't be ashamed. Pull it. Remember that time when you and Ralphie Mauser were gonna have that house painting job? Got your finger caught in the ladder, you cried for about five, six days. John, just pull it! Good God. Jesus! This is the last time you had a tetanus shot. Slowing down because you got a piece of rebar on your side? Pfft, what a pussy. You gotta man up and take some responsibility. Jeez, if this was what their relationship was like, no wonder his kid despises him. They need to steal a vehicle, so they go to a nightclub car park to find not only some wheels, but some weapons too. A scene that's lengthened in the extended cut. Nine small handguns? Please, what does it look like we're doing? Defending Nakatomi Plaza? How'd you want all these guns around here? It's a uh, Chechen hangout. Owner doesn't like guns in the clubs that these bozos leave in their cars. What? Why would mobsters go to a nightclub that didn't allow them to bring their weapons inside? And why would they leave enough heavy artillery to orbit Arnold Schwarzenegger in the back of their car? Are we really going to Chernobyl? The radioactive joint meltdown? That's the one. It's not the Chernobyl in Switzerland, right? With all the, the skiing and the snow and everything? You mean Grenoble? <laughs> no, sorry, we're not going to Grenoble. <laughs> Grenoble's not in Switzerland, it's in France. But don't worry about your cultural ignorance. You're only hanging to the site of the worst nuclear plant disaster in history. Speaking of which, the movie implies the city of Prepyat in the Ukraine is only a short drive away from Moscow. You know, because Russia is such a small place. I looked it up and the distance between the two is over a thousand kilometers apart, and to get there you would need to be driving for 12 to 13 hours. And that's not factoring in that you're riding in a stolen car that belongs to Chechen gangsters with a shitload of guns in the back, and one of your passengers is a wanted criminal who escaped his trial. That might add some significant delays, I think. However, in this universe, you can travel there in a car almost as quickly as by helicopter, as they arrive shortly after, where Arena and Alec are forcing Yuri to access the vault to collect the file as they wear their protective suits. But the McLeans aren't afraid of a bit of radiation, they just need their guns and they're good to go. Sorry, I fucked up your day. It wasn't my plan, and I caused you problems. And all that other bullshit, I mean, I had a pretty good day. It's fun running around with you. So the whole time that you spent getting shot at, yelled at by your son, killing people, and nearly ending up dead several times counts as a good day? I think all this time fighting terrorists has warped his brain. Using the key to open the vault, what's inside is definitely not paperwork. But before they start playing O to Joy, there's a small matter of the fact that the room is highly radioactive. But don't worry, the bad guys can fix that with a special tank of gas. Compound 274, it neutralizes radiation. Trust me. All clear. We can ditch this it. Yeah, don't worry about radiation because we've cured it. All those people that died horrible deaths due to exposure, they just sort of sprayed down the area and then they would have been able to walk through it just fine without any of their suits. In fact, let's get another canister and just spray down the whole city and make it habitable again because we've solved radiation. It's bad enough this is taking place on the sites of a real-life disaster, but this is offensively stupid, and it treats the audience like a bunch of fucking morons. What they've unearthed is piles of uranium that Komarov stored away, which rather pisses off Alec. No more games, where's the file?
That's no longer your concern. <gasps> what a heavily foreshadowed twist! Surely Alec must have figured out that it didn't exist when Komarov told him it was in Chernobyl. Even if it did, who the hell is going to venture out to find it anyway? Yes, Daddy and Daughter have actually been playing a preposterous double cross, and it seems everyone else bar Alec was in on it, since no one seems to care that he's dead. Apparently perfectly timed masseuse assassins are easy to come by even when you spent years in jail. So let's get this thing straight. Komarov told Shigarin they had a non-existent incriminating file fully expecting him to send a team to capture him, and rather than say silence him, would take him straight to the evidence to retrieve it, while planting his daughter as a mole within them, so he could continue his illegal radiation smuggling operation. Wow, that is a really foolproof plan. We're dealing with a regular Hans Gruber here. What makes this twist so frustrating is that it's so arbitrary, coming so late that we've wasted an entire film building up Bugs Bunny and his boss, and the good guys have been protecting the main villain, which makes everything previously worthless as the McLeans themselves come to learn. Never was a file, was there, Yuri? Of course there was no file. It was simply bait. Jagar was the only one with enough power and influence to get me out of jail. I used him. I used you. It's about money. When's it not about money? Yep, it was all about the money, just like all the other Die Hard movies. Except for Die Hard 2. As the two lead Komarov out of the vault, Irena and henchman Marco start a gunfight allowing the villain to escape. Marco, no, not that one, we could tell is really tough because he doesn't even wear a shirt in these conditions, but he's soon taken out by a huge grenade-triggered gas explosion. Hey, did you know that fire can make dormant radiation become mobile again? Basically what I'm saying is that every explosion that happens in this climax is making the place even more radioactive. The McLean split up to go after the father and daughter. John goes after Arena, who is taking off in the helicopter but can't get into the cockpit. Jack, meanwhile, chases Komarov onto the roof. Man, I can't wait to see who wins in this battle between a 20-something secret agent and a middle-aged man who has been shot in the arm. Not that the movie remembers that. Irena opens fire on Jack to aid her dad, forcing John to take action. The shit we do for our kids. Yippee guy, motherfucker. the most half-hearted, tacked-on place that could have possibly inserted McLean's signature kiss offline. It isn't even at the conclusion of the sequence. What a shame your father won't be alive to see you promoted. <laughs> Neither will you. Ooh! I quite like how silly this death is and how it changes Bruce Willis movies. It starts out as an Alan Rickman impression and then it turns into the last Boy Scout. The only way I can imagine that they managed to get away with this is because they didn't tell Willis about it. So as the helicopter is wildly unbalanced, the truck ends up crashing into the roof, knocking John out of the cab and leaving him dangling from the front of the vehicle like a cartoon character. He eventually lets go, fleeing him at least 30 feet through the air through a glass window into the building to safety. Shortly before the truck is hit again, severing it from the helicopter and landing on the gas tank so it explodes. Yeah, but let's rip off a bit where he's fighting the F-35 from Die Hard 4.0 which is one of the worst parts of that movie, and let's make it even stupider! They might as well have put in comedy sound effects and tweeting birds, it would probably be an improvement. Irena wants revenge on the McLeans, but is out of bullets, so she sets the helicopter to kamikaze into the building, while her co-pilot does absolutely nothing to stop her. Needless to say, this stupid idea fails miserably as they dive out the window as it crashes, this time with no clue where it goes, but luckily there's a swimming pool at the bottom to save their dumb asses. So that's not one, but two action scenes in this movie that end with them diving out of a building to evade a helicopter. Do you think they're running out of ideas? 
incidentally pools of water are very contaminated in a radioactive environment, so enjoy your acute radiation sickness, boys! Dad! Right here. Just call me Dad. No. You hear things. You got swimmers here. I hate to break up your emotional moment, but you're rolling around in broken glass! That's how far John McClane has come by this point. Not even glass hurts him anymore! So as the newly bonded McLean smirkingly walk through the second worst thing to happen in Chernobyl, that's where the extended cut ends, leaving out the final scene of the theatrical cut showing a cheese-tacular reunion with Lucy back home on American soil that finishes with a corny freeze frame of all things. Unlike the other movies that all ended on a pullback as emergency services arrive, but who gives a shit? Even as a fan of the franchise, A Good Day to Die Hard is not only a disgrace to its namesake, it's also one of the worst big budget action movies in recent memory. As much as it pains me to say this, it's abundantly clear that the Die Hard well is completely dried up by this point. There is barely the faintest echo of the original classic in this soulless embarrassment that has virtually no connection to the earlier movies, but damages it by association. Even without the name, this is an inconstant action movie, as director John Moore's awful camera work and editing turns the whole film into a headache, the villains are lame and thinly drawn, and the cobbled together script is clearly an afterthought thought between mind-numbing set pieces. But the worst thing about the film is Willis himself, who's phoned in and disinterested reprisal of his star-making role sees him barely show up as a sidekick in his own movie to Jai Courtney's lunkhead replacement. And John McClane's become this massively unlikable wanker that gets his kicks out of hurting people, especially if they don't speak his language. This is radioactive waste that makes the highly divisive fourth film look like the first by comparison. In the end, it's a good day to put this series out of its own misery. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker.